Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here and to talk about sex education and abortion. Uh, I did think about titling the talk, What Do Economists Know About Sex? Um, unfortunately, we, we do have a little bit of a, of a reputation. And I, unfortunately, it's not the reputation that we're, uh, we're all touchy-feely, know about emotions and can relate to people very well. They say that uh, God invented economists to make, uh, make accountants sound interesting. And there's some truth to that. And you do have to be, to be careful. When econ if an economist comes up to you in a bar and says, can I uh, tell you about my stimulus package? He's not thinking about what you're thinking about. <laughs> that, sorry, that was my best joke. So it doesn't it go any better than that. I won't tell you about economists liking to do it with models. But never mind. Um, anyway, where, where the starting point I want to make with sex education is, first of all, to say that this is not um, a, an argument for or against sex education. In fact, I'm not going to say a great deal about rights and wrongs. One of the good things about being an economist is that we don't have any morals or emotions. We're very robotic, we're very uh, single-minded, but that can help when you're trying to look at facts and figures and trying to look at evidence that may or may not support your arguments. Okay? And in fact, one of, the, one of the things I do, I'm a school governor, and I'm in fact the school governor responsible for uh, school sex education or overseeing school sex education in a secondary school in Nottingham. So I'm certainly not opposed to the idea of schools doing sex education. What I want to talk is about some of the links with abortion. And here's a, a starting point. You may have sort of seen this sort of, had this sort of argument put, put to you, that somebody says, right, you know, if you really say you're pro-life, you wouldn't bother trying to change the law on abortion. That will have no effect. What you really need to do is to get sex education, contraception to young people, that will cut abortion rates. And it's a very sort of powerful uh, argument for many people. It's quite shallow to some extent, but I think it's something that we've, we've come across. And that's sort of my, uh, my starting point. You know, what can we say in response to that argument? Is there some validity to it? But there's some specific issues relating to sex education that are going on at the moment. And you may, if you were following the Select Committee on Education report on sex education, right, I had to go and give some evidence uh, in front of them, but they highlighted the, the big issue that we might be worried about. So first thing we might be worried about is that SRE, so that's a, the sort of acronym for Sex and Relationships Education, uh, the, the official government guidance insists uh, that good SRE is about linking to so-called sexual health services. And of course sexual health services will include um, contraceptive services but also abortifacients, so the things that people commonly call contraception but may have an abortifacient mechanism such as a morning after pill or emergency birth control, but also to abortion. Within that sort of sexual health services, abortion are included. That's the first thing. The second thing is that uh, there's a big emph uh, emphasis, any of you who's, who've been involved in this, dealing with schools and so on, on confidentiality. So these services should be provided to schools and to children confidentially. If they go to see the school nurse and want to get condoms or be given the morning after pill or potentially um, be taken for, a, for an abortion, parents do not have to know. So you can have 13, 14 year olds who prescribe these things. So there's a, a sort of typical headline, you know, age 13 and um, given the contraceptive implant or given the morning after pill and parents are sometimes amazed. Well, hang on, you know, if my daughter is 13 and she wants, she needs a paracetamol for a headache, the school are not allowed to give it typically. You know, there may be some medication which children, I mean, I've got children who are teenagers who are at school uh, and, you know, if they, they have to self-administer medication that's sometimes allowed, school can't give anything. They have to ring the parents, get them home. If, the, if a child wants to go to the school nurse or to a sexual health clinic, 13, 14, be given the morning after pill, put on a, an implant or the contraceptive pill, parents don't have to be informed. Okay? Then the fourth thing we might be concerned about is what happens in sex education and where it, where it starts. I'm going to say much less about that, but you know, sex education can mean all sorts of different things. It can be very, very appropriate and sensitive, or it can be very graphic and inappropriate, and it can start at different ages. And there's a big push at the moment to um, start sex education for all schools at primary school level, right at key stage one from the age of five. Okay, and again, the devil might be in the detail, but that's an issue of concern um, to people. But the thing I want to say, bearing in mind, I'll, I'll talk about facts and figures and some um, you know, academic studies, that's what I'm interested in, I'm, I'm an economist, so that interests me, better interests you, or you're in for a, a tough uh, next 50 minutes. Um, but at the back of our minds, it's really important that we uh, remember that actually we're dealing with real people. So here's two individuals, um, which you may or may not have heard of. The, the, the character on your left 
William T. Saturday is an American. He was a teacher in McHenry County, okay, in, near, uh, in Illinois, near Chicago. And a while back, he was, he was in his mid-20s, and he started having an affair with one of his pupils, who was, I think, 13 at the start of the affair. Anyway, when she was 14, he um, took her to the local family planning clinic, and they put her on a contraceptive, uh, gave her a contraceptive injection. And of course, they didn't tell her parents. And she, she told them that, you know, well, my boyfriend's two years older than me, and if you don't do this, I'll probably get pregnant, I'm going to have sex anyway, the normal sort of things. And of course, this affair with this mid-20-year-old man went on for a long time. Eventually, the parents found out, they, they sort of you know, picked up eventually on mood swings and depression, what have you going on, with their daughter. And eventually, it came out that she'd be having this affair with the teacher, and the abuse had been perpetuated by this sexual health clinic. Okay? And that had been going on for, for however many months. Well, in that case, those parents eventually had a big campaign and they're the only county in America where they stopped um, providing birth control without being able to inform parents. They said, well, it was a condition of getting money from the federal government. And they said, well, no, we're not going to take the money from the government anymore. And so that clinic still doesn't, um, you know, won't provide those services to a 14-year-old girl. The other, the other um, girl in the picture is Melissa Smith. You probably won't have heard of her a few years ago now, but she was from Nottinghamshire, where I am, so I live in Nottingham. She's from the north part of the county, very um, high rate of teenage pregnancies in that, that part of the county. And they had the standard sort of sexual health services. She went to her um, school nurse and, and told her she was pregnant. And the school health professional uh, took her to the hospital, not, not straight away, but eventually took her to the hospital uh, to help her have an abortion. Uh, and this girl was, uh, she was 14, Melissa, and she was given the abortion, uh, given the abortion pill, RU486. She went home, you take the abortion pill at home, and she started having a, you know, as you do, a sort of miscarriage up in her bedroom. And that's when her mum found out, when she was in the middle of having the abortion in her bedroom. Okay, so this poor girl facing that situation, this poor mother, of course, was absolutely outraged, how could this happen? How could the school do this without my permission? I uh, could not believe it was legal, but it was absolutely clear, and indeed the law was clarified once and for all a year later, that this was completely legal. Right? That um, the school, you know, maybe you know, there are certain conditions where you're meant to inform parents, but in principle, you don't have to inform parents before taking a 14-year-old to have an abortion. So she was there on her own, in her bedroom, with her mum downstairs, not knowing what was going on. I, mean, I, I find it horrific. And, the upshot of the, the story is you know, how terrible for her. A year later, Melissa was pregnant again by the same, um, same boy, and she did have the baby um, at, at that stage. But you know, this argument that, well, we need these services because this is going to stop uh, teenage pregnancy and so on, is really at the, at the heart of things. It's really at the heart of things. So these are some questions I want to talk about now. There's lots of them. I mean, it's a massive topic. Lots of other things we could talk about. Firstly, you, you, you may have seen in the news, teenage pregnancy in this country has gone down quite drastically over the past few years. And so a big question is why? And if you read some of the, the, the press, you'll say, or you read the Family Planning Association where they comment on statistics, they'll say, oh look, you had more uh, contraception and sex education, uh, and this is why you had the teenage pregnancy strategy some of you may have heard of um, a number of years ago, and this is why uh, teenage pregnancies are going down. Well, this is sort of the, the research I do looking into the statistics and what, what is the, the real driving factors behind it. Uh, in particular, does access to birth control for teens, so birth control in the broadest sense, in the morning after pill, um, implants and so on, long-acting reversible contraception, they call it now, where they inject uh, young girls and, and, and you, know, you don't have to take a pill every day and so on. Does this actually work in reducing abortions, teenage pregnancies? And that's a really important issue. It's not the most important issue. We're here out of principle. But actually, if somebody, you know, you, you, if you're a parent or you know parents and somebody says to them, well, you know, your 13-year-old daughter, do you really want her to get pregnant? And the response, of course, is, no, of course not. Um, do you want her to go on the, on the pill? No, of course not. I don't want her to be having sex. But, but if it's the difference between her getting pregnant and, you, and you're telling me it's better off if she's, she knows the services are confidential, Perhaps that's the, the, you know, the lesser of the two evils, or perhaps rather that happen. It's a very attractive argument to many, uh, to many parents who perhaps don't have strong views one way or the other. So it's a really important question. And then you know, the talk's titled Sex Education and Abortion. I'll say a little bit about you know, what is the evidence on sex education itself uh, and abortions or teenage pregnancy and so on. But I'll perhaps leave some of that for, for questions. So the, the first question is about 
um, teenage pregnancy rates in the UK and abortions. There you go. At first, it's been, it's been a while before I've shown you a graph. That's quite good, isn't it? Um, here's a graph of teenage abortions in this country. You can see um, up to, this is for under 18s, that's sort of the, he the headline group which the government's been interested in looking at. You can see for a number of years, very little change. Um, from about 2007 to 2008, we've had a really steep decline in teenage abortions. The same for um, teenage births as well as it happens. Okay? In fact, there's other countries that have experienced something similar. New Zealand's experienced something similar. You know, England's always had um, the highest rate of teenage pregnancy of any, uh, pretty much any country in the Western world, um, even higher than Scotland. By the way, these figures are for England because the Scottish figures don't quite coincide in how they collect them, but the pattern is not dissimilar for Scotland. What's been going on in the past few years? I'll just add to the graph. We talked about it. I mentioned the government's teenage pregnancy strategy. That started in 1999. This was a big effort where they said, you know, we're going to push everything into um, more family planning, more birth control for teenagers, confidential access to abortions, to um, birth control, more sex education and so on. A really big push. This was when we had the morning after pill free of charge and chemists and so on. Quite interesting. What, what do you notice about, the, um, about the, the graph and the two points when the teenage pregnancy strategy started and ended? It's interesting, isn't it? So we had it started in 1999. Eight years later, when hundreds of millions of pounds have been spent, abortion rates were actually slightly higher than at the start of the period for under 18s. Birth rates were slightly lower, so that perhaps there was a, some effect on the on the you know what happens once a teenager gets pregnant. But a really big change in 2007. Okay. Possibly, you know, some argument might be made, well, perhaps, you know, this was all a delayed effect, you had to build up, and over, over the years, more sex education and contraception and so on has had more of an effect. It, it, it's not impossible, but it's not that plausible to have a sudden change eight years after the programme started and when all the money was spent. So if you look at when the money was spent, that big sort of mountain is the teenage pregnancy expenditure. And if you try and look at the correlation between that, even allowing for a lag of a year or two, you could almost make a case for saying the correlation goes, if anything, the other way, that the more expenditure there, there was, it seems to go in the opposite direction to, um, uh, almost, sorry, sorry, almost with teenage abortions. But also what's interesting, around right about 2008 onwards, as, a, as the economic crash started to happen, cuts were made, the teenage pregnancy strategy gradually wore, wore down, local authorities tended to cut their teenage pregnancy coordinators, cut services. And if you go back to some of the news reports at the time, there were squeals from people like the Family Planning Association, Brooke and so on, saying services are cut, teenage pregnancy rates are going to start to go sky high. And the, and the decrease that started in 2007, you know, that's going to, going to change and go up. But what's happened since then? Well, if anything, the opposite. If anything, the, the drop in teenage pregnancies has accelerated. So it's a bit, a bit of a puzzle. Now, we're, and Ira talked about cause and effect quite rightly. We have to be very careful about cause and effect from simple sort of time series graphs. So, you know, as an economist, if I'm looking at that, to say, well, you know, there's nothing which is consistent with a teenage pregnancy strategy leading to a reduction in teenage abortions. There's nothing consistent with this story of more sex education lowering teenage abortions. But possibly there's all sorts of other things going on, big factors. And if you delve down into the detail, you know, those areas which have introduced more of this, um, uh, of, you know, explicit sex education or access to birth control have had bigger drops in teenage pregnancy rates than others. And that's the sort of basis for the research that, uh, that I look at. But let's take a, take a step back. I said economists like doing it with, with models. We do. So we usually like to sort of state the absolute obvious, but with lots of maths and equations and so on. I won't reflect any of those on you. But just to say, you know, what is the obvious in this sort of situation? People, their starting point is, surely it's obvious. Teenagers are getting pregnant. If they were using contraception, or they, they got more information, we all want teenagers to have good information, and I would agree with that. And um, surely it said that fewer of them will get pregnant. This must be part, not the only solution, but part of the solution. So there's a you know, very simple argument. If you offer confidential birth control services, teenagers know they're safe. You know, they might be encouraged to tell their parents, but ultimately their parents don't have to know. You're, they're much more likely to use these services to use contraception, to get condoms to be put on the pill and what have you. So more of the sexu sexually active um, young people use birth control, you get fewer pregnancies. Okay? Very, very, sim very simple argument. Um, there is a problem. If you look at the data, this is some data from the British Pregnancy um, Advisory Services, one of the biggest providers of abortion. 
Their data, when they survey women coming for abortion, for young people, 70% of young women who come for abortions say they were using contraception at the time. 70%. Now, it's a survey, you know, there may be, uh, it's not necessarily accurate, but it fits in very much with rigorous academic studies which look at people who have abortions and the amount of people who were already on or knew about where to access contraception. So there's a bit of a problem if you've got this issue of teenage abortions, and in fact the vast majority are already using contraception, the argument that well, we need more contraception or better access is likely to help that problem is on shaky ground. It's not necessarily wrong because maybe that other 30%, maybe fewer of them would get pregnant if you, if you could make services better. Okay? But there's at least a, a question mark there. So how would an economist Look at, the, uh, look at the problem. Well, this is where we would bring in all the uh, um, equations and so on. Well, I won't, I won't bring, bring in the equations, but let's start with a couple. So we try to abstract. You know, our models are about assuming everything away that really matters. You might not like it, but actually it can be quite helpful if it helps you to sort of get rid of the things that aren't really important and focus on the problem at hand. So let's focus on a, let's say, a 14-year-old couple. They're boy and girlfriend. They've been going out two weeks. They really, really love each other. Uh, <laughs> about having sex, you know, with a party, a party next week, you know, let's think about having sex. What's going on? What might the economic model say? And the economic model, contrary to what you might think, is not, does not tend to be about money. Economists are, are actually quite good at, at saying, well, let's think about the decision-making process which might encompass all sorts of things. So what might be the sort of things that are going on in the mind? Well, somebody might just say, I think it's wrong. Never, never going to do that. You want to have sex with me, off you go. Okay? Somebody might say, um, well, you know, I'll regret it afterwards. It's just too early for me. On the other hand, maybe I'll say, oh yeah, I think I'd really like it. I might really enjoy it. I've heard it's great. Or, um, you know, he'll chuck me if I don't do this. If I don't have sex with him, you know, that sort of unspoken pressure. All these things going on. Let's think about some other things that might be going on. So, I might get a sexually transmitted infection. I might get pregnant. I don't want to get pregnant. My mum will kill me. My dad will kill me. They find out. On the other hand, just use a condom. Make sure you don't get pregnant. If you do, condom splits will go to the chemist. You can get the morning after pill. Your mum and dad don't have to find out. They don't need to know. Look, the school nurse told us. So if, you, if something goes wrong over the weekend, come and see me and I can help you out. Your parents don't have to know. All these things are going on. So what will happen? What will the decision be? Of course it will be different for different people. There's a phrase that really annoys me when I see it on the, in the media. You get somebody from the Pla Family Planning Association or somebody ringing in on a phone and they say, well, you know, you can't stop 15-year-olds having sex. If they decide they're going to have sex, they're going to have sex whatever you can do about it, whatever you say. The only thing you can do is make sure they have sex and are protected. And of course, it's a, it's a load of nonsense. It's true for some, there are some people who perhaps, you know, want to have a baby, want to get pregnant, and maybe they will have sex anyway, or they're just desperate to have sex, and they will. There are others who never will, whatever you do. And then there are some in the middle who it depends. They're at this party. The boyfriend's bought a bit of drink, or maybe it's a girlfriend trying to persuade the boyfriend. Who knows? They're a bit tipsy. And that changes their decision-making process. Or they're rubbing an iron and saying, oh, well, I might regret it, say I get pregnant. The boyfriend says, look, I got a condom from the school nurse or wherever it was. I'll make sure you don't. And maybe that tips the balance. It won't for everybody, but for some people, it will. So we economists talk about at the margin. You ever heard that phrase, at the margin? We talk about the marginal person. You know, some people who, you know, nothing you do will make any difference, but there are some people right at the edge. They're at the margin, and small changes affect them. And when you're looking at averages and the economy as a whole, or teenage pregnancy rates as a whole, those people at the margin matter. So let's just sum up what, what might happen. For example, you provide condoms at schools as part of your sex education <coughs> policy, let's say. So, yet, yeah, more young people will use condoms, probably, if they're promoted. Pregnancies should go down. But, at the same time, some of those people at the margin will have sex when they wouldn't have done otherwise. The people at the, bo at the bottom half of the slide. Some of those will get pregnant. Maybe they, um, you know, actually use a condom and it doesn't work. We know they have very high failure rates. Maybe they think about the morning after pill. They end up not accessing it. They have sex and they don't bother to go down to the, the chemist. Their decision changes. Okay, whatever. Some, young, some of those young people will get pregnant. What happens overall, we just don't know. So this idea that it's so simple that you can provide as part of your sex education program more birth control, 
or access to abortion or what have you, and you will reduce the number of teenage pregnancies, it may be true. You can't say for sure it's not true, but you may find the opposite happens, or you may find the two effects sort of cancel each other out. Yeah, and you don't get um, an effect either way. So, if we go back to the, other, the original question, you know, what's been going on? Why have teenage pregnancy rates and abortion rates gone down so much over the past few years? One of the big things that's changed since about 2007 that would coincide is that that was when long-acting reversible contraception really started to be pushed. That was a big change. So before that, you know, there was more of an emphasis on the pill and condoms. But around about 2007, 2008, doctors did, uh, you know, the government did encourage doctors and family planning um, officials to promote LARCs, L-A-R-Cs. So injectable contraception, the patch, um, the implant and so on. That could well be an explanatory factor because, of course, you know, you don't have to remember to take the pill. You know, the condom isn't going to split. You get injected and that's it. Off you go. There might be all sorts of other problems. You know, it's quite possible that could reduce pregnancy rates. And it may still be wrong because, you know, perhaps we don't want 13 or 14 year olds to, be, to encourage them to have sex. Or because some of those methods can be abortifacient, so they may cause very early abortions. But it may be that the measured pregnancy rates, one of the reasons they've gone down is because of larks. The other thing that's... Um, Changed. A couple of other graphs here. You may not know this, but you, know, you are the sensible generation. Did you know that? Over the past, since about 2007, some of the trends even earlier, everything risky, and what your you know, parents and grandparents said, oh, that's bad, we don't want teenagers doing that, you've done less of it. So you're smoking less, you're taking drugs less, you are drinking less. So one of these lines looks at the, the proportion of people who say they drunk of teenagers who say they drunk alcohol in the last week, and that line's going down significantly. We could do the same for smoking and drugs, and in fact, crime. It's one of the sort of social uh, science mysteries of you know what's happened to you, what, what what's happened to you. I'm expecting you to tell me, by the way, in the questions afterwards what's been going on. I've got one theory I'll come to a bit later on, but of course, some of those th some you know some of those things might matter for teenage pregnancies as well. You know, fewer young people getting drunk on a Saturday night, having a bottle of vodka in the bus shelter when they're a bit bored, you know, may mean fewer pregnancies. The other line looks at education. There has been, without doubt, a dramatic change in educational outcomes amongst particularly the more vulnerable groups. So the areas where teenage pregnancy rates are higher, particularly in London. And, you know, you can argue politically about what the causes are, but there's no doubt we have a much higher proportion of young people staying on at school after 16. We have a much higher or lower proportion of youngsters leaving school with no qualifications. And that's a classic, um, you know, risk factor for very early pregnancy because, of course, you know, you haven't got your exam results, you've got less likelihood, perhaps, of getting a good job or um, going to university or college. And so perhaps the, the opportunity costs, what we would call as economists opportunity costs of getting pregnant, very early on, are lower. You know, you're not losing quite so much by getting pregnant at 15 as you might have done if you were, you know, really had much higher chances of getting a good job or going to college. So that also has changed. That could be one of the factors, all right? So um, this is what uh, the, the latest research paper which a colleague of mine, Surafel Germer, and I have been looking at, exactly that issue. You're very, very, I was going to say fortunate, but that wouldn't be quite right to, you're perhaps not fortunate for me to tell you about it, but you are the first people that I've told you about it. This paper came out earlier this week, so it's had no, um, you know, no one really knows about the, the research outcomes. There's, uh, I think there's going to be something in the Independent on Sunday tomorrow on it. They publish it, we'll see. Um, but this is what we did. We decided to look at um, teenage pregnancy in England, because you've got a very nice set of data, we have very good data on abortions, on pregnancy rates, they estimate the age of conception um, of, the, of the women who get pregnant, um, and we looked at these factors, we said, well, let's look at the promotion of LA, LARCs, LARCs, these long-acting reversible contraceptives. So look at the areas which have promoted them the most, and there are various measures of how, uh, you know, how, which areas promoted them more than others, looked at those areas which promoted the morning after pill free of charge and chemists and so on. Um, and we looked at other things. The number of people in areas who are staying on in, high, in uh, further education after the age of 16. Looking at uh, alcohol use. Also looking at changing demographics because one of the big changes, particularly over this recent period, big influxes of people from all sorts of countries, from Poland, from parts of Africa and so on, and possibly those groups of people may be less at risk of pregnancy. So some people have suggested that you know, you've had more religious people where 
um, early sexual activity is more of a taboo and that might have affected teenage pregnancy rates. Also, other people have suggested, well, some of the you know, immigrant families are often really keen on pushing education and that might help explain part of the improvement in education in some of these families and again, that might feed through into teenage pregnancies. So what, what we did, of course, you can't just look at those areas with high pregnancy rates and say high rates of um, contraceptive because you'd be confusing cause and effect there for sure. It may be that uh, you know, areas promoting contraception most heavily are those areas which had high teenage pregnancy rates and that's why they're promoting it because you know, they've got a big problem so they get more money. So what we tried to do was to, uh, two things, to look before and after. So we constructed what's called a panel data set looking over time and across different areas. So you can compare those areas that have introduced these schemes more than others and what happens to them over time compared to other areas, which allows you also to control for big things like unemployment changes that might affect everyone in the country and could also affect um, you know, the, the rate of teenage pregnancy or, or lots of other factors. We also put in lots of other variables that, to try and control for all sorts of things that are known to be associated with teenage pregnancy rates. So that's what we did. I won't, go through, I won't bore you with all the detailed statistics. I would love to, but you wouldn't. Um, so these are the, these are the headlines. LARCs had little or no impact. We can't say for sure no impact. It's much harder to prove a negative than a positive on teenage pregnancy abortion. In particular, if you looked at um, the promotion, our measures of the promotion of LARCs, and this, this is quite surprising to me. I'm not, I would be very opposed to the promotion of LARCs on principle grounds, but I was quite happy to believe that it may have affected teenage pregnancy rates. But you look at the promotion, most of the estimates are negative. In other words, it looks like more LARCs lead to fewer pregnancies, which is what you'd expect. But A, the effects are very, very tiny. So nothing like enough to explain any part of the decrease in teenage pregnancy rates, but also virtually none of them are what we call statistically significant. So in other words, even though the sort of headline figure, if we had to guess, is, is that there may be a small effect, it, we can't dismiss the possibility that it's zero. So really we would say, well, if you're being really pushing it, you might say we found evidence of no effect, that's pushing it a bit too much. We found no evidence of an effect. We found really strong evidence for education though. Changes in education were able to explain the vast majority of changes in teenage pregnancy rates across areas. So those are areas that cut their teenage pregnancy rates tended to be the ones that improved their exam results, making it simple. We also found a, a, a reasonably strong um, presence of this demographic argument that areas with uh, more immigration were the ones that had seen bigger uh, decreases in pregnancy rates. We're, we're not so confident about that result because the data is much harder to get and um, consistent over, over time. We can talk more about what we, what we use to, to proxy that, but so we're not quite so confident on that result. But the education really came out. Emergency birth control, that's, you know, EBC is often called the morning after pill. The, the so-called sex births like to call it emergency contraception. Well, I think the best term for it is emergency birth control, given its potential abortifacient ac action. No effect at all. No effect at all. I'll, I'll talk very briefly about some of the other studies. This is not a surprise. The LA LARC finding is new. No one has looked at the effect of LARCs. And as I said, I was quite prepared and expecting to find a, a bigger effect there. But emergency birth control, we know from study after study, it has no effect on teenage pregnancies and abortion. When that was being promoted, the, uh, we were told this is going to cut unwanted pregnancies by 50% at least if we can make it easier for women and girls to access uh, emergency birth control. Every single study to date finds no effect on unwanted pregnancy, teenage pregnancy, abortions. Okay, that's the thing, you know, lots we don't know about social science, we have conflicting findings, not on, on that point. Um, oh yeah, so why, why are you the sensible generation? I'd say I, I'll give you my theory. Uh, education doesn't explain everything, and of course there may be other things going on underneath it, but you know, there's no doubt that, you know, you can say surveys People don't always, they might tell you what you want to hear, but if you track surveys over time and from different sources, this is, this is the case. You are the sensible generation, but it is true in lots of other countries. Because, you know, this, we're seeing a bigger picture, aren't we? That teenage pregnancy rates are going down at the same time as all these other things. So it doesn't really make sense to think that, well, so-called, you know, suddenly school sex education has suddenly started to have an effect. You know, people have been doing drugs education, smoking education, alcohol education for years. And similarly saying, well, it doesn't seem to have much effect what we do in schools, but something has changed. This is my theory as to what changed. Uh, I, I think it's the um, social networking. Uh, and it's only a theory, it may be completely wrong, you know, we haven't t tested this on evidence. But the timing really works out. 
You know, look at my, my kids and uh, you know the timing. That they're, my eldest is nearly 18. When you look at the real growth of uh, the Facebook, of all the, the new social work networking apps. It really times in well with this change in risk-taking behaviour. Uh, and you know, you, so that sort of to stereotype. Instead of sitting on the bus shelter with a uh, with a bottle of vodka and then you know disappearing into the park with your you know 15 year old friends, you're sitting in your bedroom. And there might be all sorts of bad things you're doing on the computer, but you're sitting on your own in your bedroom, communicating with um, with friends elsewhere. So that's my theory. But you'll know much better than me because you're living through this. So you might say, well, that's a that's a load of rubbish. But there is something going on that people don't really understand that's changed in the past you know seven, eight, nine years. Um, Anyway, I said about other research, I won't, uh, I'm quite keen to, we have plenty of time for questions, but uh, by the way, please think of some questions or we'll be sitting here in silence, or, or I can, there's lots more I will be able to say, uh, talk about, but I'll be going for a few minutes more. Um, so, summarising some of the research, and this is, uh, you know, there's some citations in the evidence to the select committee, if you want to sort of go and look at some of the papers, and by the way, if any of you, you know, you get a research paper, um, and uh, I love the, what was your phrase here, was it telling the truth with, well, no, lying, lying with the truth. Was that right? Yeah, lying with the truth. I really like that because you do see that a lot with research papers where they find a very clear finding and then you look at how that's spun and what the recommend, recommendations are at the end and there's no connection between the two. I, I see this a lot, you know, I get uh, papers to review and some, sometimes they're quite good and they're often, you know, they might be on sex education in Poland or Cyprus and it doesn't matter what they are, there seems to be universally, whatever the, the survey they've done or the evidence they find, the solution is always, so Poland needs more sex education, or Poland needs, or Cyprus, or wherever the country is, and the solution always seems to be the same. You think, hang on, where did that come from? Um, so you do see that a lot, but if any of you come across a paper and you want to, you know, you want a bit of advice, what does this really mean? You're more than welcome to get in touch with me, to send me an email, I may not be able to help, but if I can, uh, I will. But there's quite a lot of references in that um, submission to the select committee. But this is a, re a fair summary. So virtually no peer-reviewed paper, I've already talked about this, finds that the morning after pill cuts teenage pregnancy rates. Parental consent for birth control, there's much less evidence. But the evidence that is there suggests that it doesn't lead to more abortions or teen pregnancies. So for example, if you were to say, like in that McHenry County, okay, if you are going to give the pill to a 13 year old, you at least have to tell parents. Paper on looking at this in Texas, another state which have started to make it compulsory, at least in some areas, to tell parents before you give birth control. And the you know, squeal saying, well this is going to lead to more teenage pregnancy rates. The evidence isn't there, but there's not so much research, so we need to be a bit cautious on that. There's much more research about parental control for abortion. So states in America, certain states have said, well, okay, if you're 15 or 14, you're a minor, in some states it's 16, you can get an abortion, but your parents have to know, or in some cases, your parents have to give permission. And these are, these are wonderful case studies from a, you know, forgetting about the rights and wrongs of them, but for, for us as economists, because you could say, well, what happens in those states before and after compared to other states that are similar that didn't have these rules? So you can get a nice, you're not, you're not certain about cause and effect, but as close as you can get in social science. And it's very clear that we don't just get fewer abortions, as you might expect, you also get fewer pregnancies in the first place. So it's not just that young people don't have abortions and then give birth, they end up fewer of them getting pregnant in the first place. So we go back to that decision-making process, and part of it, abortion, if you like, is a bit more costly, not in money terms, but in the fact that my parents might find out, some of those young people don't get pregnant in the first place, whether they take more care and use contraception, or whether they decide to delay having sex, or they take less risks when having sex, or a mixture of all three of those things, we know the outcome. We also know that uh, STIs have gone down in those states, so it does look like those teenagers take fewer risks. And in fact, there's one study suggesting, uh, not suggesting, finding quite clearly that um, teenage suicides went down in those states. A win, win, win situation. They, uh, are they talking about that in this country as a way of tackling teenage pregnancy or teenage mental health or STIs, which haven't been decreasing? You don't see it anywhere. Um, anyway, you know, that's one of the things I said at the start. You know, that, that bloke telling the pro-lifer, you know, don't try and change the law on abortion. You won't cut abortions that way. Actually, it's not true. You can look at a range of abortion laws. Abortion laws, even those that don't completely outlaw abortion, do tend to reduce abortion, some more than others. And then the last thing, I said I won't say too much, you can ask me more questions if you want. School sex education in itself seems to have little effect on abortion teenage pregnancy rates. 
In fact, we, we can go a bit further than that. There's very weak evidence, very little evidence that it has any effect. We need to be careful. It's not evidence that it has a worsening effect. It's not particularly evidence um, that it causes young people to have sex uh, earlier or with more partners. You know, there's one or two studies on either side on that question. So we don't need to exaggerate the evidence. But there's no evidence that this is necessary to cut teenage pregnancy rates. Remember what I said at the start, I'm not saying that means you shouldn't do sex education in schools. But in a way it's quite a liberating thing because what it allows you to do is to think, well, what sort of information should young people get? What's the right age to get it? What's the right way of delivering it? What's the right mix between schools and parents? Without saying, as we're often told, you have to do that because it's the only way we will cut abortion or teenage pregnancy rates. Something we haven't, haven't talked about, but it's really much in the, in the news. If you read the Select Committee report, this is something they're really bothered about. And you've seen, I'm sure, um, just last week, the report from Oxfordshire of, school, of young girls under um, you know, sexual exploitation. What's the solution you get to these situations? Almost unanimously, it's, well, they need more sex education. They need more sex education in schools. We have to be very, very careful about this. Look very carefully, because of all these scandals that they have in Rotherham, in Rochdale, in Oxfordshire, and they had one in Torquay, where young girls were exposed to grooming, sexual exploitation, there's actually a common factor. And if you, it's very interesting if you read the uh, serious case review reports. I'll give you a couple of quotes. Here's one from the Rochdale serious case review. So this 14-year-old girl went to the school health practitioner, school nurse, for a pregnancy test, proved positive, she told her, she didn't pretend, she told her she'd had sex with a 21-year-old man, okay, and she didn't want her mother to know. I mean, I don't know what you're thinking at that stage, but, you know, you'd think that flags would, would come up. Uh, she subsequently went for an abortion, and they, the, the quote, this is from the serious case review, there is no evidence that consideration was given to safeguarding concerns, to concerns about child protection. Here's another, another quote from um, the Torbay Serious Case Review, because we hear a lot about consent. Yeah, have you heard, you know, we've got to give, uh, encourage young people to be informed consent. Have you heard the phrase, you know, you see in sex education, wait until you are ready, until you know you're ready. I think it's one of the most dangerous phrases you can imagine in, that, in an educational environment. But this is what the Torbay, they said, well, you know, it, it's accepted by everybody that sex is not something to worry about in terms of abuse if it's mutual consent and with somebody of a similar age. But they said, of course, we have observed that much of the abuse happens with people who are sometimes only a couple of years older than the person concerned. And, of course, people in very vulnerable situations will not always tell the truth about their partner. So if you know that there's going to be a red flag, if you say, oh, I had sex with a 21-year-old and I'm 13, and you're under pressure, and you want to get put on the pill or whatever it might be, a natural response is to say, oh yeah, I'm, me and my boyfriend, yeah, he's 14, I'm 13, um, you know, we're, we're gonna have sex, whatever you say, um, you know, put me on the pill. It's a natural response. The professionals know this. I could quote at least three more serious case reviews where the provision of contraception to young people has perpetuated child abuse, child sexual abuse. Right, what's the response? The response of these reports tends to be what we need to do is to have, uh, not to stop providing birth control or abortions without parental knowledge for under 16s, but to make sure we look out for sex abuse. So people are told to have a checklist to look out for signs of sex abuse, so you have a review to see whether somebody's at risk of sex abuse. I'll give you one example of this. Um, if you, you've heard of Brooke, I'm guessing most of you. They're the sort of primary um, so-called charity who provides sexual health services for young people. Uh, very, very um, pro-abortion, as you can imagine. And they have developed a tool which the Oxfordshire case review, that's the most recent one, has included as, uh, you know, as part of their recommendations. So this is a, you know, a useful checklist if you're worried about uh, safeguarding. And they divide behaviours into green, orange, green, amber and red, like a traffic light. And so they say, uh, now these are their, their behaviours, the things to look out for between the age of 13 to 17. Okay? I'll just sort of focus in a bit on um, what they mean by uh, green behaviour. So they, green behaviour represents safe and healthy uh, sexual development. 
So here's an example of what they mean by safe and healthy sexual de development. Remember, we're talking about a 13-year-old here. So consenting sex with others of the same or opposite gender who are of similar age. And what's the response to this green behaviour? This is safe and healthy. The response is to give positive feedback. So this solution to this e endemic child sexual abuse, as part of it, is more sex education, and as part of that, to carry on providing um, birth control services without parents knowing, but to have this sort of a checklist. I mean, in fact, I think it's a nonsense to talk about similar age anyway, because we know that young girls will often not tell the truth about the, the age of their partners. It's like saying, well, you know, we'll put this problem back under the mattress. This is, gonna, is this going to solve it? Of course it's not. Of course it's not. So just, you know, reminding us of what, some of the things that the, uh, the Torbay um, evidence talked about and the, uh, the, the Rochdale evidence talked about. So, a couple of things I want to end off by, by saying. First of all, I'm an economist, I'm biased. Facts, figures, studies, research really matter. They really matter. We know, you know the old sayings that people can do whatever they want with statistics. There's some truth in that. We have to be careful. But what I hope to do is at least to give you some ammunition so that you can be prepared for the arguments you will face. But even though they matter, they're not the really important thing. At heart, the reason you're here, I would think, and the reason I'm here, and the reason I've been involved in the pro-life movement for so many years, dating back to when I was at uh, university, University College London, and by the way, we had the same issues that many of you face now of being, try being banned from campus, stopping being giving leaflets out, trying to say that we shouldn't exist as a society and so on, and I have to say right from the start, the support we had from SBUC was magnificent, which is why I've stayed involved and supported SBUC since then. But at heart, this is a human rights issue. And we know that. This is not about the facts and figures. You know, we, we, as I said, we shouldn't be exaggerating the evidence. There's enough evidence that fits in with, uh, you know, coincides with, uh, with our point of view, if you like. We don't have to go and make things up or exaggerate. And sometimes scientific studies won't come out the way we want them. That's not really the point. This is a human rights issue about what's right and wrong. And at heart, that's not just to say, you know, people sometimes try to make pro-lifers feel guilty. They'll, they'll make you feel, well, you know, you're very high-minded at, at best. They might just say you're bigoted, ignorant, uh, unscientific idiots. But at best, you know, they'll give you the impression, well, you're very high-minded, you know, very high -minded. I understand your principles, but you don't live in the real world. What a lot of nonsense. Because this is very much about living in the real world. It's a human rights issue because people, humans, are at the heart of this. So you are here, I would guess, and I am here, because we care about the unborn baby growing in the womb, every one of which is a unique, wonderful individual person. We're here because we care about the mothers who are pressurised into having abortions or feel they would like another choice or don't quite have, the, have full knowledge to make a proper choice. We are here because of those 13, 14 year old girls who are abandoned by the state to sex abuse, who uh, have abortion used on them to perpetuate terrible things that are going on with them, we are here for those individual people. Thank you.